Wait, just listen to this. This is one of the best sounds a motorsport fan can hear. That's a 2005 Ferrari F2005, the one that Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello drove. And it's one of the best sounding cars ever. But as the pistons are moving up and down and all of those explosions are happening, what's actually going on that makes a V10 like this just sound so good? Well, I've always wondered, so I did some research to find out if it's just personal preference or whether there's something scientific about V10s that makes our brains love them. We were lucky enough to have V10s in F1 for 16 years, from cars like the 1989 McLaren MP45 to that 2005 Ferrari F2005. But let's rewind to see how we ended up with these beautiful engines in F1 in the first place. Because before that, engine regulations in Formula 1 were much looser, which meant we saw some wild designs. For example, in the 1950s, there was a huge variety in the engine configurations, including inline 4s and 8s, V12s and 16s, and even a huge V-twin, something you normally only see on motorbikes. Then in the early 1960s, the rulemakers brought in a tiny 1.5 litre maximum capacity, with most teams running small V8s. But then in 1966, things opened up again, and normally aspirated 3 litre or turboed 1.5 litre engines were legal. Most of the teams used a V8 mounted behind the driver, but some teams experimented with large inline fours and even an H16. Okay. Pause for a second. Have you ever seen this H16 engine? Well, just look at this technical drawing. BRM came up with this wild idea to create a three liter engine by basically squashing together two 1.5 liter V8s from their previous year's car. But you might wonder why go to all that trouble? Well, I'll get into why engine builders pick a certain number of cylinders later. But the gist is that BRM wanted a three liter engine with each piston as light as possible to allow it to rev higher and faster without falling apart. The thing is, the more pistons that you have, the lighter each can be, which allows them to move up and down faster. But more pistons means a longer engine. Imagine trying to fit a V16 or even an inline 16 into a race car. It would be ridiculously long. So BRM stacked the engine to save space, opting for an H configuration. However, it turned out to be a complete flop. The engine drank fuel and oil and failed to finish 27 out of its 40 races. But hey, props to them for the innovation. That's the kind of engineering that we love. So back in the late 70s and 80s, Formula One had this amazing turbo era where the engine configurations were totally unrestricted. But in 1989, the rulemakers decided to put some limits in place. They capped the engines at 12 cylinders and restricted their size to three and a half liters. And in my opinion, this is where the real magic happens with the sound. The standout for me is the 1989 McLaren Honda V10. That engine had the best noise of them all. And it wasn't just V10s at this time either. We had V8s and V12s in the mix as well. This all went on to the year 2000, when rules changed and allowed only V10 engines. And V10s weren't just used in Formula 1 either. They were actually used a lot in sports cars, such as the Toyota TS010. And the Peugeot 905. And the Dallara SP1 Judd. I've driven a load of cars with that fantastic Judd V10 engine. And let me tell you, it's not just fast, it also sounds incredible. And while we're on the topic of sports cars, I do have to give a shout out to the Audi R15. It was successful winning Le Mans, but since it was a V10 diesel, it didn't quite have that same sound. Before diving into why they sound so amazing, let's consider why V10s are a solid choice for an engine layout. You might think that more is always better, so why not just go for a V16 or a V24? Well, let's flip this around for a second. Imagine we're working with a 3 litre maximum engine capacity, but we can play around with any configuration we want. So, take a one cylinder setup as an example. You'd need one giant and heavy piston. Consequently, the connecting rod and the crankshaft would also need to be beefed up to handle all of that weight. This setup would produce a lot of torque, but the moment you crank up the engine and get that piston moving, 
all of that weight is likely to rip the engine apart pretty quickly with any kind of RPM. Now, if you add more cylinders, you can spread that three liter displacement across lighter pistons, reducing the moving mass. Think about it, lighter pistons with the same material strength means you can move them faster and then you can reach a higher RPM. And RPM is crucial to engine power. RPM determines how often the engine can complete a power cycle. Basically, how frequently the fuel explodes every minute. A higher RPM means more power cycles per minute, which translates to more overall power and more speed. However, there is a limit. Push RPM too far and mechanical and thermal stresses will start to kick in. So of course, power is great but why not just add endless cylinders, like a V12 or even a V36? Well, adding cylinders is beneficial, but only to a point. And more cylinders means more complexity. Think about all the extra valves and the longer crankshaft that you'd need. And a longer crankshaft drastically increases the risk of it bending. And in Formula One, reliability is king. There's no use being fast if you can't finish the race. There's also the problem of engine length, which if too long will make the car a disaster in all of the corners. At a certain point, adding more cylinders makes the engine too heavy and long for a racing car. Designers like Adrian Newey aim to keep F1 cars tightly packed and aerodynamically efficient. If the engine doubles in length, any power gains are likely lost due to worse aerodynamics. So V10s are surprisingly all about compromise. Even if calling a 900 horsepower engine rev into 19,000 RPM a compromise might seem a bit odd. It's basically a balance of complexity, size, weight, fuel consumption and reliability. So let's find out the science behind why V10s sound so good. But before we do, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. If you like learning from this video, you'll love Brilliant. Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive maths, data analysis, programming and AI lessons. Their way of teaching is incredibly effective. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts. And this method is six times more effective for learning than just watching lecture videos. Learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do, both for personal and professional growth. Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in just minutes a day, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have the time. It's the exact opposite of mindless scrolling and Brilliant gives you access to all their content for free for a full 30 days. Just visit brilliant.org forward slash driver61 to start your free trial today or scan the QR code on the screen. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Right then, let's find out why V10s sound so good. Well, most of the sound from a race car comes from the engine, especially the exhaust system. After combustion, the exhaust valves open, releasing high pressure gases into the exhaust manifold, which needs to merge these gases as smoothly as possible for maximum power. As these gases move down the exhaust, they create sound waves, and these waves eventually hit your ears as that beautiful race car sound. But why is the V10 sound in particular so distinctive and so naturally pleasurable? Well, I first thought about the firing order, the sequence in which each cylinder fires. And it turns out it makes a difference not just in power, but in sound too. Renault did a study in 2006 on their championship winning engine from 2005, comparing 24 firing orders and found the sound did change. And the power varied by about 3%, from the best to worst, based on just how the cylinders were fired. So the firing order does have some effects. And that's one of the reasons V8 sound like they do. The deep rumble comes from firing cylinders on alternate sides of the engine from left to right, creating that signature burble. Now the sound of an engine can also vary based on the firing interval. Think of it like this, as the crankshaft rotates, it triggers each cylinder to fire at certain points. The time between these points is what we call the firing interval. For a V10 engine, if it's firing evenly, each cylinder fires every 72 degrees of rotation, which makes the engine sound smoother because the exhaust pulses are evenly spaced, and so they don't crash into each other. On the other hand, an odd firing engine has uneven timing between firings. This creates a bit of a rumble like what you'd hear with a V8, where the exhaust gases are lightly uneven, adding to that characteristic growl. 
So, if the exhaust pulses are firing out neatly, one after the other, like with our V10, the engine tends to sound pretty crisp. But there's another cool thing about V10 engines, especially in Formula 1. They can rev incredibly high, over 19,000 revolutions per minute. This high revving means more combustion cycles per minute, and so pumping out more exhaust pulses. This frequency of pulses makes the engine sound not just loud, but also gives it a high-pitched clarity. Because these pulses are so closely packed, coming out at high speeds, the sound you hear is sharper and clearer when compared to the lower, more spaced out sounds you might get from an engine with lower RPM. But there's more. Humans can hear sounds from 20 to 20,000 hertz. This means we can detect up to 20 separate bangs or explosions per second before they start to blend together into a single continuous note. Now, if a single cylinder engine revs at 1200 RPM, that fits into our 20 hertz human limit. At that speed, the engine's noise just about merges into a low, smooth note rather than a series of separate explosions. But then, if you add a second cylinder, you'll be able to hear the engine's pitch twice as high because it gains depth as you hear the low note and the octave. A third cylinder would introduce a third distinguishable note with three times the frequency of the low note, which in music terms is known as a fifth, a musical interval that follows the harmonic series. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. Now, every time a new cylinder is added, there is a progression in the harmonic series, but the magic happens with a V10 or theoretically any multiple of five cylinders. With the fifth harmonic, the engine lands on a major third, and people tend to like the sound of a major third, because it naturally fits together well and sounds smooth, and, well, happy. Yep, science says that V10s makes our brains happy. So when a V10 fires, you get the ensemble of a low note, the octave, and the major third, resulting in an interval that's widely considered to be consonant which is a combination of tones that sound harmonious and pleasant together when played simultaneously. In other words, it's pleasing to our ears. So why might V8s and V12s not sound quite as good? Well, they don't have the right number of cylinders and sit at the wrong level on the harmonic series. They lack that major third. But if you've ever been to a circuit with loads of V10 engines on the track, you know it's not just about the science. At the start of a race, you can literally feel those 20 F1 cars vibrating through you. You can smell the burning fuel and feel the rush of the cars going past. It's a total sensory overload and it's absolutely amazing. V10s are awesome, but have you heard heard about the sports car that had four snowmobile engines, one for each wheel. I talked about that and some other wild cars in my latest video about Canam. Check it out just up here. And if you made it this far into the video, please consider subscribing. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.